If you would turn in your Bibles uh, to Romans chapter 13, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 10 this morning. Would you pray with me? <laughs> Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for being with us, Lord. Um, we thank you for being uh, the good teacher, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for being our pastor and shepherd. And uh, Lord, we just pray you would, you would uh, teach us this morning, you would lead us, you would guide us, um, you would encourage us. Um, yeah, Lord, give us ears to hear and you give us hearts that, that want to hear and receive your word and, and just ask you to uh, light our path and, and do your work of transformation in us through your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've had several people in my life recently dealing with heart issues. I was just telling Courtney that it's kind of uh, interesting, ironic, that several people have uh, been in, out, in and out of the hospital with, with heart issues. And just makes me realize how important and how central our hearts are <laughs> to, our, to our bodies. You know, Our bodies are complex system, systems, and it's the heart that pulls it all together. And in our passage this morning, you know, Paul talks about uh, love being the fulfillment of the law. And what that says to me, and I think what we're going to see this morning, is the much like the heart is central to our body system, that uh, love is central to God's system. Uh, to his way of working. Um, much like the heart, it, it nourishes, it sustains, and it aligns everything uh, in God's uh, kingdom. And so that's why Paul says that love is the fulfillment of, of the law. And, and so that's what we're going to look at uh, this morning. Uh, first, I want to give you a little context, back up just a little bit. Um, you know, in the book of Romans, Paul shares the gospel uh, in such a, a beautiful and, and powerful way. Um, the point is, is that we're all uh, under sin. Uh, we all need a savior. Uh, no one is, is, uh, is innocent, uh, both Jew and, and Gentile. Everybody's under sin. And uh, we're sla- we were slaves to sin, but Christ came. And uh, through faith in him and his sacrifice and his resurrection, uh, we're set free from sin in order that we can live a godly life, in order that we can live for, for God and have eternal life. That's what Jesus has done for us. And so he finishes this up. And in Romans 12, it, it's like Paul is saying, uh, now, so you're a Christian now. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Now what? You're a Christian now. Now what? And um, he says, well, it starts with uh, looking at yourselves and your lives as an act of worship. And everything you do should be uh, unto God and to his glory. So everything you sh- should do should be like a sacrifice to God. It should be an act of, of uh, worship. And, and allow God to begin to renew your mind, right? You've been born again. You've been made new. You've been made a new creation. Now allow him to do that renewal within you, right, to change uh, perspective. That word repent for instance. It means a change of mind, right? And so it's something that you do when you change your attitude towards God, but it's also an ongoing process as God changes your mind, and he renews your mind, and he shines his light on you, and he uh, helps you to see the world differently around you. And so Paul says, so this is what it looks like to be a a true Christian. And he starts laying that out in chapter 12. Um, you're a child of God now, and so this is what it looked like. It changes everything. Uh, it changes your interactions uh, with one another. It changes how you support one another, uh, especially in the church. It changes your attitude towards your enemies. Um, it even changes how you look. You know, the context of, of, of uh, when Paul is writing there under uh, an evil uh, government in the Roman Empire, um, it's going to change how we even interact with, with uh, the world uh, around us. What Paul is, is saying is like the Christian life 
what it really boils down to is it is all about love. And so let's take a look at Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. That's where we pick up this morning. Romans chapter 13, and starting in verse 8, Paul says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, or any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So, Paul is saying that love is our primary obligation. In the Christian life, it all boils down to love. It's our primary obligation. It's our top uh, uh, value. Um, And so, it's what he's been talking about since... Uh, the start of Romans 12 and what a true Christian looks like. You, you can define all that. All that is wrapped up in love. Uh, so you're now God's children. It's time to start making that a priority. Um, just like the heart um, never stops beating from birth to death, um, love uh, is continuous. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, love never ends. You know, there's all these other gifts Paul talks about that, that are going to, to cease. You know, there's going to come a time there's no, uh, there's no use for things like uh, prophecy and, 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 and tongues. And even in a sense, even hope, right? Because when, we, when uh, the new creation comes, when eternity comes, when Jesus returns, our hope is here, right? And so there's no need to hope, for, to hope anymore because it's come to fruition, Right? So things like that will cease, but love continues into eternity. It will always be. And so love is like that heartbeat. It should never stop. It's the one thing that the Bible says that God is love. That is who he is at his very essence and at his very core. Um, So it should be our primary uh, obligation. And, and, And Paul says, in fact, if you're going to be indebted to somebody in anything, it should be love. If you're going to look at yourself as, as you owe it to somebody to do anything, you owe it to them to love them. Why? Because humans are created in God's image. We're each created in God's image. So we owe it to one another to love one another. In fact, earlier in Romans chapter 12, he says, outdo one another in showing Honor. So I I look at it, love is like something, if you're going to be competitive in something, if you're going to strive for something, strive to love one another as if we owe it to them. Because love is at the heart of of God's law. Uh, You know, Paul said earlier, he's been writing uh, to Jews and Gentiles in this letter. That's what the, the, the letter to the Romans is all about. There's, you know, it was a church made up of Jews and Gentiles and uh, one of the points that he's wanting to show them is actually it's a major theme uh, throughout Romans is um, is that they're all under sin and that we all have a Savior in Jesus Christ. He points out that having the old covenant law, right, because so the Jews took pride in having this Mosaic law, right, which the Gentiles didn't have. They were the heathens and we had the Mosaic law. And so Paul points out that having the old covenant law, it doesn't make anyone better. It doesn't make you better because you have the law. It doesn't make you more righteous because you have the law. You can't just wear that as some badge and, and say that that somehow makes you uh, righteous. Um, in fact, the law only reveals your sin. And he says the, the Gentiles, they're no better because they, they have, a, they have or they, they can't escape, rather, is because we have, uh, the Gentiles have a, a, a law that is written on our, on our minds, right, that tells us what is, is right and wrong. So we all have this law from God that we, that we know inherently, and that law reveals sin. So being unkind, 
dishonest or putting other things uh, before God. But the good news in uh, the book of Romans is that Jesus sets us free from the power of guilt and sin. And in that, he also gives us a, a new covenant. But it wasn't the law, it wasn't as if the law was bad, right? Uh, in fact, Paul says that the law is, is good. And the essence of the law was love. Think about it. When we think of the Old Testament commandments, they are all about love. Now, in Christ and in the New Covenant, we are, we are, um, we're no longer uh, bound by um, um, the exact rules of the Old Testament, but the spirit behind those rules, love, continues. And that's why the, the, the love aspect of the law continues in Jesus Christ. Don't steal, cheat, hate, murder, adultery, idolatry. Those are all things that Jesus uh, talks about because they're all about love. That's the heart of God, and that never ends. When we love, we're living out what God's law was all about. We sang the song this morning, Oh, Holy Night. There's a line in that song. It says, truly he taught us to love one another for his law is love and his gospel is peace. The law of love continues. And realizing this, for me, it was a, it was a huge uh, par- paradigm shift. It, it helped me um, uh, to realize this. It helped me uh, to understand that all sin, get this, all sin is a failure in love. So whenever we sin against God, whenever we sin against our neighbor, it is a failure in love. And this helped me decipher what was, what was a true sin and what, what I call are, are, are pseudo sins, right? Think about it. The Ten Commandments, for instance, are all about what? Either loving God, loving ourselves, or loving our neighbor. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment, right? What is that about? Loving God, right? You shall not make for yourself a carved image. That's about loving God. You shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain. It's about loving God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It's a little tricky, huh? What's that? Who said both? Both? Why is that? Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you said that. So, yes, we're honoring God and keeping the Sabbath. But what did Jesus say about the Sabbath? He said, uh, the man wasn't, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for us, right? It was made for us to, as a day of rest. So when, when we fell to, to rest, to take a day of rest. Now, again, this is more complicated than the bounds of this sermon. We are not under the Old uh, Testament uh, uh, law, but... The spirit of the law remains in taking a Sabbath. Now, we have our Sabbath in Christ. We have our rest in Christ. But it's good and healthy for people, humans, to take a day of rest, right? Because God made that for us to take a, you know, created their six days, seventh day rest, you know. And so we are called to rest. And so, yes, that commandment is about uh, about loving yourself and you're right, loving God and, and ourselves. Honor your father and mother. Loving others, right? You shall not murder. Loving others. You shall not commit adultery. Loving others. You shall not steal. Loving others. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Loving others. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey. Now, we don't have ox and donkeys and servants and stuff like that, but you've got to bring it up to the 21st century or anything that is your neighbors it's all it was all about love god's law was about love and so again understanding this helped me to distinguish between like what was a real sin and and what 
what wasn't, right? So I'd look at like, you know, I, there was a time where um, I wouldn't say I was a new Christian. I was saved as a boy, but I wasn't very uh, educated, I guess, in the, in the Bible, you know, I wasn't really uh, walking the walk. And so there came a time I was wanting to get serious about my faith, right? And you know, I would struggle with certain things. So like playing cards, right? See somebody playing a, a game of poker or something like that. And I'd be like, oh man, I don't know. And, you know, again, Bible says we're going to get into this, into Romans 14. He's going to dive even deeper into some of this stuff. But like, I'd be like, ah, and good thing I didn't participate at the time because my conscience wasn't clear, right? And if I think I'm sinning against God and I step, step out and actually do it, then why would you do something if you think you're being unloving to God, right? But Turns out, when I started to understand that sin is a failure in love, I was like, how is playing cards unloving? And that made it clear for me, and I don't have a problem playing cards. Probably came from gambling, right? A lot of these, a lot of these pseudo-sins, just like with the Pharisees in Jesus' day, they had all these rules and regulations, and Jesus said they were man-made rules and regulations. They came from a good heart. The Pharisees started off as a good a, a group of, of reformers, right, who were trying to reform Judaism and, and, and get it back to the heart, right? And so they were trying to, to get back to the heart of God, but over time, they took it too far. They had all these rules and regulations that they, that they made up, and it became all about dead religion, right? And it wasn't about the heart. And so, um, so playing cards probably came, the heart of that was probably um, the idea of gambling. Well, let's, let's go to gambling then, okay? And some of these things I'm going to talk about, some of these you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I see clearly. Others are going to be like, ah, I don't know, Scott. And we're going to get to that in Romans chapter 14. Because Paul, Paul had the same problem in the churches, right? And so he's, he's going to talk about this stuff. But you're going to have to wait to another sermon for that. But if you, want to, if you want to talk about some of this stuff with me after the service, I'd love to talk about it. It's what I, it's what I do. It's what I love to do. So, um, but gambling, that probably came from the heart of the love for money. Uh, lust for money. Making money priority number one, making that your God, putting that first, right? Your, your top value, right? That is, that's a sin. That's wrong, right? Because Jesus says you, you, you can't have two masters, right? And so if you have a love for money and you have a love for God, you know, you can't love God and love money at the same time, right? If money's your top priority, it's going to control you. It's going to be that magnet. It's going to pull you, right? And it's going to pull you away from God. And so the love, lust of money um, is not good. It's not healthy. It's a sin. Uh, but gambling, not only the idea of gambling being a sin, probably also came from uh, being rash and unwise, right? Making rash decisions, especially when it comes to your finances. Money is not evil. <laughs> it's the love of money that's evil, right? I mean, money in some ways is a... I don't know, you call it a gift in this world to, to use to make the economy go, right? But being rash and unwise when God has supplied your needs through, through work, you know, you've labored for this money and to, to spend it in an unwise way is unhealthy, right? And so when it comes to gambling, how do you look at that? So for me, like, if I sat down and let's play poker and I've set aside some money for play, right, which I do in my life, I set aside money, go to the movies, you know, have fun, go play, do whatever. And I set aside a little money. Okay, so we're going to put some money, we'll play some cards or whatever. I don't have the love of money, right? So for me, I'm, I'm not being unloving to anybody. But some people have gambling problems, right? They have issues. Now, this is where I flip the script. Kind of getting to Romans 14 a little bit too much here, but like one thing we can concentrate on is our Christian liberties. I'll be preaching this again here in a few weeks, <laughs> but uh, we can we can uh, you know get caught up in our freedoms. Oh, well, this isn't a sin. This isn't a sin. We don't think about our brother or sister uh, across the table from us who has a, a, a gambling addiction, and they're going to spend their mortgage, <laughs> you know, in, in 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 gambling. You know what I'm saying? 
And so then you think about, well, casinos and stuff like that. And, you know, one sense, you know, if I put some money aside, I'm on a, a cruise or doing whatever, and I, I, I spend a little money that was just my play time money, you know, or whatever, you can say it's not a sin, but then maybe somebody says, well, what about the whole gambling system? We're contributing to that. Okay, that's debatable, all right? We can talk about those things, right? But hopefully you get my point of what I'm talking about. Like, and this is something to wrestle with. It doesn't make it easy when I say that, 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 um, that uh, sin is a failure in love. It, it's not, it doesn't mean everything is clear now, but it helped me to distinguish Am I being loving, right? And if I'm not being loving, then it's, it's wrong. It, it's a sin. Dancing. And it's not, a, I mean, at least in, in my surroundings, dancing isn't a problem anymore. I think that more like 70s, 80s, till, till Kevin Bacon came around and, and <laughs> <laughs> changed everything. Um, the great reformer, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> But maybe, I don't know, some churches, is dancing still a big, big issue? Um, maybe so, I don't know. But again, it's, that's arbitrary, but it probably came from sexual sin, which is a real, a real sin, fornication. You know what I mean? And so somehow that evolved into to dancing, right? Um, alcohol probably came from drunkenness. Well, I know it did. I mean, it came, <laughs> it came from drunkenness, you know. I don't want to, so, you know, alcohol leads to drunkenness, therefore you shouldn't have, you know. But to me, you know, again, you, there's so many things to consider. We'll get into this more. I don't want to get into it too much. So maybe I should just stop. Um, but is, are you being loving or, or unloving? Clothing you know, is, is, a, is another one. And I'm, not, I'm not talking about promiscuous, you know, uh, sexually revealing clothing, right? Um, 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 or, or, or demeaning apparel, right? That's definitely not glorifying God. But like, you know, in some circles, you know, you could consider, uh, we can stereotype, you know, this person dresses like this, therefore, that's bad. You know, this person dresses like this, therefore, that's good. Well, clothes mean nothing, right? It's, it's the heart, right? So if I'm wearing a hoodie, you know, and I look a little too gangster to you or whatever, you know, if my clothes isn't demeaning or I'm not sexually revealing, I'm not doing anything wrong. Let me be. Does that make sense? It has nothing to do with love. But if you're erring in love, you're sinning. And then some will point to... Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.22, especially if you have a King James Version of the Bible, says abstain from all appearances uh, of evil. And I remember about 15 years ago, um, there was a, a young woman with black fingernails and uh, <laughs> got in a discussion with somebody else who had said that those black fingernails, that she shouldn't do that because she should stay away from all appearances of, of evil. See how subjective it can get? Like... They think, that, and, you know, from their perspective, that looked, that looked evil or it's associated somehow maybe with evil. And so, therefore, that's, that's a sin, right? And they pointed to this scripture and I, 15 years ago that, that pushed me into the scripture. Like, whoa, the Bible really says that appearances? Because that sounds so subjective. That doesn't sound right, right? And so I went and did some digging, and all the modern translations don't use appearance of evil. They use all forms of evil because the Greek word also is translated forms. And so King James is a good translation, I think, you know, but in this particular verse, I strongly believe they got it wrong. It should be all forms of evil, abstain from all forms of evil, not appearances. Appearances, that's when we can get ourselves into trouble because what Brandon considers an appearance of evil is going to be different than what I consider an appearance of, of evil. And so we could go on and on with holidays. Again, he's going to get into the, some of this stuff specifically, you know, to music and cigars, whatever. Um, we'll get into that to, in Romans chapter 14. should be a fun, encouraging, um, and, uh, um, yeah, motivating. Uh, so true sin is when we dishonor others, jealousy, strife, manipulation, things like that. 
When we dishonor ourselves, you know, gluttony, sexual sin, slothfulness, uh, when we dishonor God with all the above, and also, you know, idolatry, which is, the Bible says, is a spiritual uh, adultery. And so that's what, that's what sin end is. But, but if we're, so if we're going to live by the law of love, Paul says to love one another is the fulfillment of the law. If we're going to uh, make this our new rule, we need to define what love is, especially in our culture, because a lot of people have different ideas of what love is. And so if you say, just be guided by love, people take that as like, just be guided by my heart, right? And I have an affection for somebody. And so that's loving, or I have an affection for this, or this is love, right? And so we need to know and understand what love is. And that's, uh, I believe in the Bible, why there's still specific commandments, because God is defining for us what love looks like, right? So there's a, a love that's an affection and it's a feeling, but there's a love that we do for others regardless. Uh, love, true love, um, is promoting one's well-being, what is best for them. It's not always what they want. It's not always what you want is most loving, right? That's where things can get confusing. It's, it's what is best for them and what is best for you and what is best for God. Um, Love is goodwill. Uh, Bible, Christmas, right? Goodwill towards men. That was the message that was proclaimed by the angels, right? To the shepherds in the field uh, when Jesus was born. God has goodwill towards men. That is true love. So love is goodwill towards others. Um, when we care for the poor and, and oppressed, when we, when we practice empathy, when we uh, practice uh, um, uh, justice and, and what that means. I always feel like I need to, to define this. You know, in the Bible, uh, especially the Old Testament, when it talks about practicing ju- justice, that doesn't mean practicing judgment against others. It means practicing righteousness. It means righting wrong. We should all be all be all. We should all be about righting wrong in the world. We should be about practicing justice. It's loving. It's loving to the world as a whole, right? It's loving to society. It's loving to God. Um, when we offer help and bear one another's burdens, when we forgive one another, that is goodwill towards others. Goodwill towards self, taking care of our physical, mental, and emotional needs is loving towards ourself. And, and then that doesn't mean, you know, again, going to our culture, there can be this looking out for number one where we become selfish, right? And it's, and it's all about uh, us. It's, it's holding that in balance, right? A lot of times the Bible talks about putting others before our needs. That doesn't mean allowing people to manipulate us, right? That's not what it's talking about. But he's, he, he's talking about putting others' needs, making them a high priority, right? Don't make life all about yourself. Put others above yourself, and we should walk that way. Um, but we should take care of ourselves, it's about goodwill towards God. How do we love God? What's that? Doing his will. Yep, doing his will. So Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's how we love, that's how we love God. That's how we best love God is to keep his commandments. I was thinking about this just this morning, actually. How do we best love our parents, especially when you're children? What's that? Honor them. I think you honor them as, a, as children and adults, right? But how do you honor them when you're still under their authorities? Obeying them, unless they're calling you to do something ungodly, right? You obey them, right? Because the general rule of thumb, you know, especially when they're leading you to do the right thing, is they're looking out for your... You're good, and so you obey your authority. Same way you love your boss, right, is be a good worker, a good uh, employee. And so the best way we love our ultimate authority is by obeying him, because God truly does, and he's not fallen or broken. He does know what's best for us, right? And he leads us in the way of, of love. He leads us in the way of wholeness and wisdom, right? And so the best way that we love God is by keeping his commandments, putting God first. And, 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 and another way sometimes can be overlooked by loving God 
is by loving others. Because <laughs> ton of his commandments, more than half of his commandments are about loving others. In fact, Jesus says, um, when you minister to others, you'll min- you, you minister to me. He says, for when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. He says, people in the last day are like, well, when did I do this? And he's like, when you did it for, for other people, when you did it to the least of these, you ministered to me as well. When you loved them, I saw that as love for me. So the point is, is just like the heart continuously uh, pumps blood to the rest of our bodies, love should flow through every aspect of our lives. It should saturate our Christian uh, walk. It, it, Jesus says, "How does what does Jesus say? How will uh, how will people know that you are my disciples? How will they know that you're my followers? By your love for one another. That's the marker, right? Jews is it, not the law, right? We're under a new covenant. Jesus has wrapped it all in in Him, and He's taken to the grave, and He's been resurrected, and He now gives us the law of of love." We're not under the sacrificial system, right? Honestly, we're not under the Ten Commandments. Some of you are like, oh! As written in the Old Testament. We're still under do not steal, do not, you know, do not covet. All of those things. There's this, there's this, there's this law of love that was within, understand this. Because when I say you're not under the Ten Commandments, but yet you are under those commandments, is because though <clears throat> we are not under the law of Moses whatsoever, but within the law of Moses was God's heart and character. And there's this moral aspect of the law that continues forever. So it's a part of the Mosaic law, and it's a part of God's law for eternity, right? And so we still obey those things, where technically we're not under the Mosaic law anymore. Does that make sense? The law of love should saturate our lives. It aligns us with God's system for humanity. Love is not just a part of the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law. You see, God's commands aren't arbitrary. They're, God doesn't just... Every commandment in the Bible, even those weird ones we see in the Old Testament, are like, what? Even if you don't understand it, right? You could do some research because God didn't just make up stuff just to, because he just wanted to lord it over us. God doesn't do that. He doesn't just make up stuff for no reason just so he can say he's God and, and, and have you do it. There's, there's reasons God does what he does, and it's all wrapped up in love for God, for our neighbors, and for ourselves. Every commandment and instruction from God is fulfilled in love. And so uh, here's the lesson. As we step out this week as, as God's missionaries in our homes, our workplaces, our, our communities, wherever we go, social media, especially here in the church, let's keep the main thing, the main thing, Let's love our neighbor, right? Let's love others as ourself. It's what we were created and redeemed for, so let's manifest the love of God in the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray.